Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. Thank you for your children. Thank you that we are not just your children, we are your servants and ministers in the gospel. Thank you, Lord, for the great privilege you have given us that will have part in the expansion of the kingdom, in the preaching of the gospel, in obedience to you and to the great commission. We are praying, O oh Lord, that this privilege you have given us will not lose it in Jesus' name. And while you speak to us, while the Spirit is still speaking, we'll have ears to hear, hearts to understand, the will to obey, the desire to do your will, and then the impact and the influence of that word and ministry will be in us, and through us, will affect other people in Jesus' name. Speak to our hearts tonight. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, we pray. We thank the Lord for the privilege we have in the studies we've been having for our leaders in our leadership meeting as we come every week. In introducing the subject of today, I want you to please open to Matthew chapter 13, verses 16 and 17. But blessed are your eyes for what they see and your ears for what they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. Many times when God gives us great privilege and great opportunity, we really don't understand and we don't appreciate until that privilege and opportunity is taken away from us. That's why Jesus Christ told the people of his own generation, the time in which he lived, that the queen of Sheba will condemn that generation because she came from a very far place to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And then he told them a greater than Solomon was there. And when he was talking to the churches in Asia Minor, he ended up each message by saying, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. You need to take the opportunity while the opportunity is there. And you need to show the Lord that you have the desire to hear, the desire to obey, and that you really appreciate the word of God that we are receiving. Because a time comes, and a time might be here for many people outside. And a time might come upon us if we do not appreciate the privilege that God is giving us. That time is revealed in Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, says the Lord God that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The Lord originally had great, great desire to speak his word to his own people, but the time came when they were despising that word. And as the Lord looked ahead, he said the time was coming when there will be a famine upon the land, not the ordinary farming, like we learned in the time of Elijah and of Ahab, but the farming of hearing the word of God. And he said in verse 12 of that same Amos chapter 8, that they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. And then it says, they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. If the Lord could say that, it must be a great thing that will come upon those children of Israel. In fact, Isaiah tells us that's one of the greatest chastisements, punishments, manifestation of the wrath of God that anybody and any group of people could experience. In Isaiah chapter 30, reading verses 20 and 21, and though the Lord give you 
the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner anymore, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. The language of that verse is saying he will not do it anymore, means he has done it once. He removed their teachers from them because they didn't appreciate the depth, the height, the length, the breadth, the mystery of the word he was given unto them. But the Lord saw that the punishment was so great for them, in removing their teachers away from them, so he said, he will not do it anymore. In verse 21, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn, to the right hand and when you turn to the left if the lord is still giving us the message of his word we ought to be so appreciative and we ought to accept the word of god because if we don't we have examples of our senior brothers and sisters of churches that started before us and they had the fullness of the word of god but because they didn't appreciate what he gave them is taking their teachers away from them and is taking the word of God away from them. We could mention denominations that had the word of God before, but the word of God is no more there now. And then they are now languishing in spiritual hunger and thirst and famine. I'm appealing to this church that we should still have the desire for the word of God and say, Speak, Lord your children and servants are hearing while we'll still have the opportunity while the lord is give, still giving us a chance and he's still giving us a teacher to teach and still giving us ears to hear we continue with the series we have at present when joshua chapter one in joshua chapter one today we're looking at following a leader who is under authority following a leader who is under authority here you will learn from last week, we're looking at chapter 1 from verse 10 today. In verse 9, God himself challenged Joshua. In verse 9, and he said, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? He said, Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. It was on that note we stopped last week. And you will find immediately Joshua had those encouraging words. He showed his readiness that he was going to obey the Lord implicitly. He was commanded that he should observe to do. According to all that God had commanded Moses, his servant. And we're told the testimony of the life of Joshua. You will find in Joshua chapter 11. Joshua chapter 11 verse 15. Here is the testimony we have about him. It says, As the Lord commanded Moses, his servant, so did Moses command Joshua. And so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. I've been listening to uh, this uh, book, uh, Joshua. What I do is, if I want to study a book, I take the cassette and I listen to that book in the cassette and I open my Bible and listen over and over again so that uh, I'm not just uh, staying with the chapter that um, I'm looking at. I get a feel of the whole thing. And I've been doing that with Joshua. And there is something that strikes you from uh, reading from chapter 1 all through. You'll find that although Moses had left them, Moses was mentioned over and over and over again. In fact, in chapter 1 alone, you have the mention of the name of Moses more than 10 times. Which means, although Moses, the man of God, is gone, although the servant of God is gone, but the word of God liveth and abideth forever. And Joshua knew that. That's why Joshua, all that Moses had commanded, because he got it from God, he knew that God is the eternal God. And therefore the word is the eternal word. And although Moses had gone, the word was still there. And Joshua did according to everything that had been commanded. That Joshua was a man under authority. 
and throughout his ministerial life, he kept to the word. And now, in the passage we are looking at today, he was going to command, he was going to commission, he was going to tell the, give the order to the officers that were under his control. And the officers were going to talk to the people. There's something that will strike you. As you look at chapter 1, and it is what you see at the gate, what you see at the door, what you see at the threshold of the book itself, you will find throughout the whole book that the people, their hearts were touched, their hearts were moved, their hearts were bent to do the will of God and to obey the commandment of Joshua as they followed him because he himself was a man following after the Lord. You see the way it was, he was a man under God's authority. Therefore, the people were under his authority. He was a man obedient to the leadership above him. Therefore, the people were obedient to him as their leader. Actually, it acts like a boomerang. If you are obedient to your leader, then the people who are subordinate to you, they will be obedient to you. But the other side is true. Whatever we sow, that we reap. If you are disobedient and rebellious to the leader above you, then the people under you, they're going to make you reap exactly what you are sowing. Now, it's very uh, striking in this uh, last part of the chapter that the words command, commanded, com uh, commandment are mentioned eight times within 12 verses. Which means then, as you look at the leadership style of Joshua, he wasn't begging them, pleading them, asking for their opinions. What are we going to do? How are we going to get the work done? He will give them the order. He will give them the commandment. And then they will carry it out. Look at verse 7. It says, do according to all that Moses commanded. That's the word. If you look at verse 9, have not I commanded thee? That's the word. If you look at verse 10, it says Joshua commanded the officers. Look at verse 11. Pass through the host command the people and then you look at verse 13 remember the word which moses commanded you and then you look at verse 16 it says all that thou commandest we will do then you look at verse 18 it says whosoever he does whosoever he be does rebel against thy commandment that's the word and will not hearken to thy words in all that thou commandest him to do so you will find the word command, commanded, commandment coming up over and over and over again. Which means then, as we're in the army of the Lord, and we're soldiers in the army, and there is a captain that is chosen for us, and there is a leader that is going before, and he commands, then we are to follow. And we too, when we get to our location, you are a leader, then you command the people, and they are to follow. We're looking at it under three uh, subtitles. Number one. Prompt response to divine commission. Prompt response to divine commission. Number two, purposeful resolution to keep the clear commitment. And then number three, promise readiness to obey direct commands. We look at uh, chapter one now, verses 10 and 11. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, pass through the host. And command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals. That means, prepare you food. For within three days, ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. It may surprise you that we are spending so much time on a few verses. Actually, it's because we don't have the time. Because those two verses alone will tell us a lot about leadership. About leadership in the Old Testament. But about leadership in the New Testament, understanding that Joshua is a Hebrew form of the Greek form Jesus. When you mention Joshua, when you translate into Greek, you're going to make it Jesus. And therefore, because of uh, the similarity between Joshua and Jesus, and because of the similarity of ministry, there is a lot to learn from Joshua that we're learning from Jesus as well, and that will help for the people in the new covenant. Number one, you see the authority as a leader. Number two, you see the courage as a leader. Number three, you see the confidence of the leader. You see his faith, and you see the way he told them, and there was uh, no doubt about it. He said, within three days, you'll pass over this Jordan. There was no rod in his hand like Moses had in his hand. 
but he knew that whatever method God will use, the same God that divided the Red Sea was going to divide River Jordan. Therefore, he commanded the people and he said, pass through the holes and command them and tell them to get prepared because there is no doubt about it, we're going over Jordan. God had commissioned and commanded Joshua and his response was prompt and immediate. After verse 9, you have verse 10, it says then. The word then marks the time. It means immediately after, promptly after, without delay, without procrastination. When God told him, have not I commanded you, then he rose up immediately and then he commanded the officers. He did not act before God spoke. He did not run ahead of God. That we learned the other time. But once God had spoken, there was no tardiness, that means no delay, but prompt obedience. That is ever the conduct of one whose heart is committed to honoring God and glorifying Him. There is no halt in between two opinions. There will be no waiting for a convenient time, like Felix. There will be no conferring with flesh and blood. Because Paul said, immediately I knew the will of God. From him that separated me from my mother's womb, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. And according to Judges, there are people that will be delaying because there are great indefinite searchings of the heart. And there are great vacillating thoughts of the earth. But not Joshua. There was no procrastination because procrastination is the evidence of a lack of heart, a lack of uh, giving, a lack of uh, concern for the divine glory and for divine precept. There was earnestness in his heart. His heart was bent in wanting to obey the Lord. And it will, not, it will not linger. According to the language of Psalm 119, look at it. Psalm 119, verse 16. He made haste. He did not delay in obeying the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 16. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. That should be the attitude of every child of God today. That was the attitude of Paul, as I mentioned to you just now, in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16. It says, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace, to reveal his son in me, that I might make him known, preach him among the Gentiles, among the heathen, immediately, no delay, no procrastination, no waiting after knowing the mind and the will of God. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself tells us that if we delay, if we say, I will do something else first before I really obey the commission of the Lord, then we're no more fit for the kingdom. In Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verses 61 and 62. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first. Whenever you put anything between you and duty, anything between you and the commission, anything between you and obedience, and you say, yes, I know what to do. Yes, I know the mind of God. Yes, I know the will of God. But let me first. Whenever self comes first, your convenience comes first, your desire comes first, your will comes first, and your project comes first, then you are no more worthy to be called by the worthy name of a servant of God. Let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put a sand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And so you understand then the kind of attitude the Lord wants us to have. He wants us to have that immediate response. To respond to the will of God. Once we know that will of God. That means then, if it's in the area of restitution, there should be no delay. If it's in the area of ministry and evangelism, there should be no delay. If it's in the area of obedience to thus says the Lord, in any area, there should be no delay. When the heart is truly in love with the Lord, there will be no delay. Because once a duty is discovered, it will be discharged immediately. Come back to Joshua chapter 1. In Joshua chapter 1, now we are told in verse 11, Pass through the host and command the people. Command the people. Joshua was telling them the same authority that he had. He passed on 
to the officers. You learned something there. You know, there are some people that will respect only the pastor, the senior pastor in the church. They will not understand that the will of God is that there must be obedience to every level of leadership. Now the pastor will command the officers. And then those officers themselves, like the people we call coordinators, maybe because we call them coordinators, there are people that will not show them the respect they ought to show them. Because actually, they are pastors. There is a pastor over the central church. There is a pastor over the group of churches. There is a pastor over the uh, district. And also there is uh, the pastor over the zone. And there is a pastor over the little group there that we call the house fellowship. And as the uh, group coordinators are obedient to the pastors and the coordinators are obedient to him, in the same way, implicitly, without looking back, without grumbling, without questioning, the people too who are under their leadership are supposed to be obedient unto them. Because that's exactly what we find. The officers obey Joshua. And then the people obeyed the officers. And when that takes place in our midst, that Joshua himself is under the leadership of God, the officers are under the leadership of, uh, the, of Joshua. And then the people under the, uh, under the leadership of the officers will find without a delaying at all, we will win the prize, we will reach our goal, and we will get into the promised land in Jesus' name. Now the officers commanded the people. And he said, prepare your victuals, because you will pass over this Jordan. Before I get away from that area, you understand? That those people, if they didn't believe God, because they saw Jordan. And if you look at Joshua chapter 3, and let's borrow something there before we actually get there. In Joshua chapter 3, there we're looking at, a verse, at verse 15. In verse 15 it says, And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priest that bear the ark, were dipped in the brim of Jordan. Look at what follows now. For Jordan overfloweth all his banks, all the time of the harvest. Now these officers, they could see Jordan. It swelled up. It was deeper, higher, broader than ever before. But the same faith in Joshua was the faith in them. And they told the people exactly what Joshua told them. They said, get ready, get up. We're going to pass over Jordan. You see, when there is the same level of faith that we're all manifesting, then we will be able, by the grace of God, carry the people along, and then we will get to the promised land in Jesus' name. But now, let us see that uh, the commandment, the tone of commandment, does not end with the Old Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, if you look at First Timothy, First Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, and... Um, Let's understand this. When in a church, the leader in the church, take for example the pastor in the church, when he becomes apologetic and he begins to beg and to plead and he begins to cringe and he and becomes cowardly, there is the judgment of God upon that church. And when a group coordinator, in talking to the group, will not have confidence, will not have boldness, will not have courage, will be afraid that he might not be able to carry the people if he did his work the way he ought to do it and the group coordinator becomes apologetic and he cannot straightforwardly say what he ought to say there is a judgment on that group and when the coordinator of a, of a, of a district when he becomes fearful, cowardly, apologetic and he cannot declare the word of God and he cannot command and he becomes afraid Already God himself is taking away something out of that district. You know, when the presence of God is there, when the unction of God is there, when the power of God is there, there will be so much liberty, there will be so much unction, there will be so much courage that the leader in the church, whether in the central church or in the local church, will have the courage to be able to command. But when that changes, then we're not following the Bible anymore. It means that God is withdrawing something away from the church. And instead of you rejoicing and saying, praise the Lord, we conquered that man. Praise the Lord. We silence that man. Praise the Lord. 
Now we can rule that man. You, do, do you see him now? He cannot be as bold as he used to be, courageous as he used to be. He cannot command us anymore like we used to do. You shouldn't rejoice because that's a curse upon the church. When the Lord is right, is really there. And the Lord is having his way in his church. The leader will have the authority, will have the unction, will have the boldness and the power. And will be able to order and control and command. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 11. In 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 11 it says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. Timothy was between 30 and 36 years of age. And a lot of people in the church, he pastored, were older than himself. But Paul said, Timothy, understand, it is not because of age, it is not because of anything that is physical or material, it is the authority that comes from heaven. And therefore, Timothy, although many of them are older than you are, this is the pattern in the kingdom of God, in the church of God. You will command when you teach. And then it says, do not let your age or your youth hinder you. You will not allow them to, uh, to, be, uh, to despise you because of your age, because of your youth. Be thou an example unto them. All those believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Now in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Looking at verse 6. Now we command. You see that? That's Bible pattern. And if they were still in the New Testament church, that's the way it ought to be. It says, now we command, we command you brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from everyone, every brother that walketh disorderly. And then it says, and not after the tradition ye have received of us. And you see the New Testament pattern. You see the word of God that actually, when we're in the New Testament church, if we're going to have the church, rule the church, lead the church, the way it was done in the New Testament and the way the Lord wants it done, you will find that that word of authority, unction, command, control must still be there. Please turn to Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. Acts of the Apostles chapter 16. I'm reading there from verse Four. Acts chapter 16, verse 4. And as they went through the cities, uh, they delivered unto them the decrees for them to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And, as, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. The thing I want you to notice there is that the apostles were in Jerusalem, the headquarters church, and then they gave the commandment, and they gave it into the hands of Paul, and into the hands of Silas, that they will go into all those churches. Listen, the apostles in Jerusalem were not even the people that planted those churches, but they were the leaders. And when they gave it into their hands, they didn't count it as the opinions of the apostles, as the ideas of the apostles. They didn't even count it as message, like we count it message. They called it decrees of the apostles in Jerusalem for them to keep. That's the way it was. That's the way it ought to be. That's the way it should be. We come back to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, you have seen very clearly now that when the church is the way it ought to be, then the leadership shall have the courage, the boldness, the authority, the anointing, the unction, everything it takes to be able to lead the church with confidence and boldness and courage. We now come to point number two, purposeful resolution to keep declared commitments. In um, Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 12, And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and has given you this land, your wives, your little ones, and your cattle that shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on the other side, on the side Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren and all the mighty men of valor and help them until the Lord 
has given your brethren rest. And he has, he, and he, as he has given you. And they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side, Jordan, to watch the rising sun. Now you see here, Joshua was talking to the two and a half tribes of Israel. Gad, Reuben, have the tribe of Manasseh. What happened is this. In Numbers chapter 32, when you get to home, you'll be able to read it yourself. Now, they said they wanted to occupy that part of the land. That they didn't want to go over to the other side of Jordan. And then Moses told them, how is it? How will your brethren pass over Jordan? And you will remain here. Will you not bring discouragement to the hearts of your brethren? They said, no. We're going to go over with them. And we're going to fight in a battle with them. But give us this land. And then Joshua made them a covenant. And he said, if you will do as you have said, and you will go over with your brethren to the other side, and you will fight with them side by side, then you will come and return unto this land. And when Joshua took over as the leader, he simply said, remember, he said, although I'm the new leader, I'm not going to change the pattern. I'm the new leader. I'm not going to change the doctrine. I'm the new leader. I'm not going to change, change the commitment that you made with Moses. Moses is not here. But the covenant you made, the commitment you made, is with the eternal God. Therefore, you still have to keep to that commitment. That's why he said, remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you. And uh, uh, that means then, we are learning something from there. It means that when you take over in your district, when you take over in your locality, what was said here? If you accept that you have a leader, your leader had from heaven, and read the Bible, and preach it unto you. When you get over there, and you are talking to the workers, the two and a half tribes of uh, Israel, and you are telling them, do this, do this. It will not be a new commandment. It will not be a new thing. It will be exactly what you have been told. And that should be for every section of the church. There should be no section of the church that uh, doesn't have the authority and the oversight of the leadership in the church. When the Edosha is talking to the ushers, he will remind them, this is what the pastor said. When the head of security is talking to the security people, he will remind them, this is what the pastor said. When the group coordinator is talking to the people, he will remind them, this is what the pastor said. When the youth leaders, the youth leader is talking to the youth or talking to those workers in the youth section, this is what the leader said. But you know, in a situation where we bring in our own idea, where we make fun and ridicule, and they put aside and jettison what the leadership has said, and we say, this is what they said. But now we're in our area. We're now in our own uh, place here. Whatever they are saying, they're, they don't understand that this is the peculiarity of the youth ministry. So then, this is what we're going to do now. Already now you deviate. But understand, you're sowing something. And what you sow, you will reap. When you sow disobedience, you are going to reap disobedience. And when you sow rebellion, if you are not obedient to your own leader, the time is going to come. It may not be far away. Along the line, you are going to reap that same rebellion. And then you will be wondering, why is it like this? Why are the people not obedient? Check up. Maybe you sowed that thing some years ago, some time ago. You sowed the rebellion yourself and you sowed the disobedience yourself. Because of that now, the people cannot listen. But understand, Joshua said, I don't have any new commandment to give you. Remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, has said. That is what I am calling you to. And thank God these people, they, they made up their minds. They were going to do exactly what they had committed themselves to do. There was a purposeful resolution that they were going to be obedient in Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse 1, and then we we'll jump on to verse 4. Psalm 15, reading from verse 1 and verse 4. It says in verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Come on to verse 4. In whose size a vile person is contained. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. And then it says, He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. That's talking about he who vows to his own heart. He consecrates to his own heart 
and it changes not. That's the faithfulness the Lord is expecting from us. You're obedient, implicitly obedient to your leader. And then the people who are subordinate to you will implicitly obey you as well. God will move their heart and their mind to be obedient unto you because you yourself, you're obedient to leadership. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 1, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The Lord requires faithfulness from you and from me that we will be obedient. And the, uh, the illustration is all over the Bible. You find Jesus Christ, he said, I do always those things that please the Father. And because he was under authority, then he could command the people under him as well. Understand whatever commitment we have made unto the Lord, even if the leadership's position, even if the leader is uh, dead, or even if there is a passage of time, because it's been some years now since the Reubenites and the Gadites and, and the tribe of Manasseh, since they pledged that obedience, even though uh, the passage of time is gone, yet we're still called to be obedient unto that covenant we have made unto the Lord, because we made that commitment with an eternal God. Now we come to point number three. Promised readiness to obey direct commands. Promised readiness to obey direct commands. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua 1, verse 16, and he answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do. Whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. Do we need to even go beyond that? If every member of the house fellowship will talk to the house fellowship leader and say, The past is past. This is a new day. We know that things have not moved on very well. This house fellowship has been marked and characterized by bickering, gossiping, backbiting, disobedience, rebellion, but now no more. You are the local pastor here as our house fellowship leader. All that you tell us, we will do. And everywhere you send us, we will go. If all the people in the zone will tell the zonal leader and say, let bygone be gone. Now there is a new day. This is a new generation. Rebellion, enough. Disobedience, enough. Everything you command us, don't be afraid anymore. Give the command. Give the, give the authority. And just tell us what to do. Everything you command us, that we will do. And then whithersoever you send us, we will go. If the women will tell the women coordinator, if the people will tell the coordinator in the district, and if the group will tell the group leader and say, don't be afraid. We well, see that the way you've been talking over a few weeks now, you are begging us and you are dragging us and you are pulling us and you are pleading with us. And we see that you are not as bold as you used to be. You are, we don't want to use the word because we're seeing your face. You're a little bit cowardly now. But we know it is because of our reactions against your authority. But now, that no more. We're telling you now, group coordinator, that whatsoever you command us, we know you're under authority. We know you have the Bible in your hand. We know you have the glory of God as your goal. Whatever you command us, that we're going to do. Whithersoever you send us, that where we're going to go. If everybody will do that, there will be revival immediately. There will be sustained revival. The power of God will come back all over again. There's Jordan in front of anyone, in front of your family. The Jordan in front of the group. The Jordan in front of the district. And the Jordan in front of the church. All the obstacles, formidable obstacles they are. I'm telling you, within a short time, everything will clear out of the way in Jesus' name. But you know, that's exactly what the Lord is waiting for. That if we will come back, and the Spirit of God will be within us. And that Spirit of God will make us to pledge obedience to the commission and to the commandment. And to the authority of the leadership at every level. You will find that the miracles that have eluded us for a long time, all those miracles will be flowing. Now I come to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 24 and 27. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 24. And he said, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. 
we have seen this day that the Lord does talk with man and he leave it. 27. Go thou near. Hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us all the word all the, that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And let us everybody read the last part together. And we will hear it and do it. If we can pledge our obedience, our loyalty, our faithfulness to the Lord and to the church and to the leadership like that, and we mean it not only for a Tuesday night, not only for one week, not only for one month, but we do it and we make ourselves a new generation of people. No disobedience again. No rebellion again. And no disagreement again. No discord, disunity anymore. You'll find that the Lord will answer prayers like he never did before. In uh, Joshua, we're coming back to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. There in chapter 1, the last uh, two verses. Joshua chapter 1, reading from verse 17, according as we hearkened unto Moses in all things. So will we hearken unto thee. Uh, 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 only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses, whosoever he be, that, do, that doth rebel against thy commandment, and will not hearken unto thy words, in all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Ah, you see now they became fanatical. They've gone overboard. They've gone beyond to what they shouldn't say. You see them now. It's good to be obedient, but it's good to be moderate about it because now they said, anybody that will rebel and will not do exactly as you are commanding, all of us were going to be united together. We're going to deal with rebellion in a ruthless way and we're going to kill him. You said, that's fanaticism. Please, before you conclude, in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. From verse 11, according to the sentence of the law, which they shall teach thee, and according to the judgment, which they shall tell thee, thou shalt do. Thou shalt not decline from the sentence which they shall show thee, to the right hand, not to the left. And the man that will do presumptuously, and will not hearken unto the priest that standeth to minister there, before the Lord thy God, or unto the judge, even that man shall die. And thou shalt put away the evil from Israel. And all the people shall hear and fear and do no more presumptuously. They were just going back to the scriptures. It was exactly what had been written. That that's the way they will deal with rebellion. You say, but we cannot do that today. You are right. But God is still judging and there's no time for me to tell you how God deals with rebellion today. Let me just show you something in Jeremiah before we close. Jeremiah chapter 44. Jeremiah chapter 44. Reading verses 16 and the first part of 17. As for the words that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That's rebellion. That's premeditated disobedience. We will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever goeth forth out of our own mouth. That's rebellion to the highest. What was the consequence of that? Please uh, keep yourself in Jeremiah. Jeremiah now, chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. Look at the consequence. Because of their rebellion. Chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, Pray not thou for this people, neither lift up, cry, nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee, because of their rebellion. In chapter 4, in chapter 11, Jeremiah, chapter 11, verse 14, Therefore, pray not thou for these people, neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them, in the time that they cry unto me in their trouble. He said, Jeremiah, don't pray for them. And if they pray themselves, I'm not going to hear because of their rebellion. Chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, Pray not for these people for their good. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. 
when they offer bonds of prayer and oblation, I will not accept them. I'm telling you that rebellion is still as serious today as ever. And the people that rebel, they still lose something spiritual. They lose something scriptural. They lose something eternal. The life of God, the inheritance they ought to have. The life that ought to be in them. They lose their life because of that rebellion. But thank God, the new generation of the children of Israel. They said they were not going to tolerate disobedience. They were not going to tolerate rebellion. God is ready to take us now over Jordan. No power can frustrate the plan of God in your life. If we will obey with a perfect heart, as they pledged on swerving, on wavering obedience to God, so should we even do today. And the victory is certain in Jesus' name. You know, they told Joshua, they said, Joshua, we know what you'll be, what you'll be thinking about. That when Moses was here, there was a Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And you know, even Moses himself, there were times he fell on his face. But his, they said, Joshua, those days are gone. We're going to tell you something, Joshua. Only be thou courageous and be strong. Exactly what the Lord had told Joshua. They repeated to Joshua. They said, don't be afraid of anything. It's a new day. It's a new generation. We're moving on. And that's what we should be telling our leaders today. No new message, not a dream, not a vision. Exactly what the Lord has told us in his word. The same we want to tell our leaders to rise and do the work and keep on doing it because we're all united. And we're going to move on the promised land. This is the generation that will possess it in Jesus' name. Why don't you rise up and be part of that generation and say, Lord, help me. Give me that heart, the heart of obedience. The heart of submission. The heart that will listen to commandment. The heart that will not rebel. The heart that will not disobey. The heart that will say, yes, here am I, Lord. Let your word come forth. Let our leaders speak. Give them boldness once again. Give them authority once again. Give them unction once again. Let them command us. Let them speak unto us. We've been disregarding the coordinator in the district. We've been disregarding the group coordinator in our group. We've been disregarding even the pastor in the central church. We've been disregarding the women coordinator. We've been disregarding the commandments coming from you, from our leaders, uh, to, through our leaders. But now rebellion no more. Disobedience no more. Disloyalty no more. Now we're going to obey. And when you do that, there will be sustained revival. There will be sustained revival. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. So that in no time at all, will pass over this Jordan.